Greetings, Dr. Wolfula here, here to present a very important special audio presentation that your ears cannot dare unlisten to. Does that make sense? Oh, it doesn't matter. Listen to this. Welcome to someone's favorite movie. I'm coming to you from the Podjack outside beautiful Bay City, Michigan. My name is Randy, and with me is the sweets to the sweet himself. His name is Tom Coe. What's going on today, sir? Hey, hey, how are you doing tonight, sir? I'm ex- what? Did you give me a hey, hey? I gave you a hey, hey. Oh, man, we're getting saucy tonight. I'm doing <laughs> great because I'm here recording this wonderful podcast with my good chum, Tom Coe. It's a late Friday night. Got a beverage in my hand. What could be better? Very few things, sir. They were covering the entire Candyman franchise, minus the ones that that's just coming out this weekend. Because you know, hey, we and, need time. Yeah, it's not really our bag, you see, to review current movies. Plenty of folks do that. Not us. We're nostalgia freaks, I guess. I guess. So, Randy, it's been a while since you and I have talked. What have you been up to lately? You know, just staying cool, keeping it real. Well, you know what? I, on the other hand, have been fairly busy. Full disclosure, this has, uh, everything I'm going to say has been before the uh, threat of the Delta variant. So, please don't think I've been terribly irresponsible. All right. But I have gone to see a couple of interesting couple of things. Okay, do tell. The The big thing that I saw was a uh, concert at Comerica Park in Detroit, uh, Michigan, USA. I went and saw the uh, partially reformed Guns N' Roses. It was a spur-of-the-moment uh, decision, and it was way better than I expected. I mean, that Axl Rose... He, sometimes he sounds like a howling jackass in the live performances. How was his voice during this concert? I don't know if it was like uh, some kind of audio magic or if it was his actual voice, but he sounded pretty damn good. Uh, granted, it was like the third or fourth stop on the uh, current tour. Mm-hmm. So maybe... Down the road, his uh, voice is going to be shot, but he sounded pretty damn good that day. I have to admit, I wasn't terribly excited to go see this concert. I I, I literally didn't know about this tour like five days before I went and saw it. But they released a new song, and uh, for like a couple hours, it was all over the internet, and I just Googled Guns N' Roses tour saw that they happened to be uh, coming to Detroit that Sunday and uh, I looked into tickets and surprise surprise it was undersold so the most expensive tickets that were available were only $59.20 so I went ahead bought it and found myself literally in the left field of Comerica Park maybe about a hundred yards away from the stage and i have to admit i had a fucking blast that's awesome you're you're getting to be a loose cannon in your old age mr tom i am i am it was about a three-hour show but it went by in a flash and i was expecting all of the worst things that you come to think of with that band which let's face it all come down to axel rose I was expecting him to be like two hours late on the stage. I was expecting him to be just like this whiny little, like just bastard on the stage. (laughs) Nope. He showed up on time at eight o'clock on the dot. And they actually seemed to have fun together. Which if you've been a uh, follower of that band, 
sounds kind of impossible, but it's true. Uh, beyond that, uh, it was just a damn good time. The opening act was a newer band that I'd never heard of. It was called Mammoth, uh, W M I'm sorry. Uh, W V H. Yeah, actually, I just heard a song by them on the radio on my way home tonight. Yeah, it's a band that is led by Eddie Van Halen's son, uh, Wolfgang. Yeah. Hence the WVH. And again, they were way better than I expected. I went to a concert uh, a couple weeks ago. It was the Counting Crows, which I've... Okay, I I, uh, worked with somebody who went to that show. Yeah, I've always loved that band, always wanted to see them, never had. Also impulsively bought tickets to that. Man, that was a great show. Like, Adam Duritz's voice has not aged at all. And awesome. you can tell that that's a band that has been doing it for at a high level for 25 years. And, mm-hmm. I mean, they know how to play together and how to work a crowd and how to be performers. It was It was an amazing show. It was great. Yep. Uh, so, I mean, if... Uh... You have a chance to go see a concert, folks. Do it quick because we don't know how long it's going to last. And that's kind of the the perspective that we've been taking. Mm-hmm. Like, let's hurry up and do a bunch of stuff before we can't. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of my mentality. Uh, literally, the like, like six days afterward, I uh, went out to Grand Rapids for a comic book convention. And God damn, that felt so good. Yeah. I mean, just being among my people for, you know, five, six hours, it it, it felt damn good. Did you buy anything interesting? Uh, I raided the cheap bin. Uh, I got like uh, three hardcovers for like 12 bucks and I overpaid for another hardcover because I'm planning on going out to Detroit again for a comic book convention and Jim Starlin's going to be there. And I got the deluxe edition of Batman death in the family. Okay. Which, uh, for those of you who don't know was where, uh, the second Robin also known as Jason Todd, uh, was murdered at the hands of the Joker. Oh no. Jason Todd was murdered at the hands of the fans. Who called in and voted to have him massacred. And uh, you know what? That is one of the quote-unquote seismic events in Batman history. I didn't have a choice but to pay cover price because God damn it, I want that signed. Yeah. I always forget that Jim Starlin wrote that. You always think yeah, of I Jim mean, Starlin and you think of Thanos and Adam Warlock. and Yeah, he's like a cosmic dude, but yeah. here was like an important story that was kind of grounded, at, at, at least as far as superheroes are concerned. Yeah, it's very disturbing. That entire scene where he beats Robin with a crowbar. Yeah, yeah, but it's kind of undercut. In the next issue where it turns out that he's the uh, UN ambassador to Iran, yeah, which is so fucking dated. And even back in like 1989, it was kind of hokey. Yeah. We do this, uh, this segment on this program once in a while. It's called, what have you been watching? Tom, go, you've been watching anything interesting. Uh, well, you know what? I have been just watching movies. I've been watching uh, a lot of old game shows for for whatever reason i don't know why it's completely stupid but i've become addicted to press your luck <laughs> okay it's just don't know how to explain it where you, you you shout at the screen where you're telling the person to just go home and they never do sons of bitches one of these days they're gonna listen to you through that screen through One of these days, space, they will listen. One of these days, they're going to listen. Gosh. What about you, sir? What have you been watching? Uh, I watched a movie not too long ago called Pledge Night, which is uh, fairly famous in the horror community. It's a cult, considered a cult classic. Mm-hmm. It's a horror movie about a frat house and the demon that haunts it. 
it's very interesting because I knew what this movie was about and I knew the protag the the main bad guy in the movie was called Acid Sid, who was a former uh pledge in the house and he was in the middle of getting hazed and during the hazing process they they accidentally burnt his face all to hell. Oops. Yeah, it happens, you know. Prank's gone wild. <laughs> so he dies, and the fraternity is forced to disband. But years later, of course, another fraternity rises from the ashes and takes over that same house. And so Acid Sid haunts that house now, killing all the people that are hazing the underclassmen. But it's really weird because... The horror element doesn't really happen until I want to say an hour into the movie and it's an hour and a half movie. So it's a slow burn is what you're saying. It's a super slow burn. I did not expect that whatsoever. Like the first three quarters of it just seems like a, a random eighties teen sex comedy really. And then all of a sudden Acid Sid appears. He's clearly inspired by Freddy Krueger. There's just no ways about it. Just his appearance and kind of his one-liners and the way he kills these kids. Uh, The only difference is he's kind of a hippie, so he's throwing peace signs and whatnot. And all right, out of curiosity, do they call him Acid Sid in the movie? Yes. All right. I'm willing to bet that uh, somebody involved in this movie is a Pink Floyd fan. Oh, that could be. Because the the guy that put that band together Sid Barrett. was named Sid Barrett. Yeah. And he is very famous for being an acid burnout. Yeah, he went kind of insane from it, didn't he? Kind of, yeah. So, Acid Sid... I don't think that is a uh, coincidence, sir. I don't think so either. I'm not going to, it's, it's not a bad movie, but man, when you're expecting a horror movie and it just doesn't happen forever, I don't know. It kind of threw me up, threw me off guard. I know a lot of people love it though. So I don't know. Well, you know what? That is not unlike my opinion of the franchise we're going to talk about. Oh, my God. Really? Really? God damn it. Tomko, I'm about to break up with you. Oh, no. Oh, no. Let's get to it. Covering the Candyman. The character of the Candyman was created by Clive Barker in his short story, The Forbidden, in 1986, which I've I've read. I read it because I do my homework. Uh. It's interesting because uh, a lot of the a lot of the elements from the original movie are in the short story, but quite a few are not. All right. In the short story, The Forbidden, the protagonist named Helen, like in the movie, she's writing her thesis on graffiti. That's what she's interested in. Uh, and on her travels, she's uh, oh, by the way, it's set in England, not Chicago. Okay. Uh, She goes to a neighborhood called Specter Street where she discovers a great work of art on one of the walls. It's a graffiti of a man's face. And uh, in the room is a a mattress and chocolate-covered razor blades. And, of course, scrawled on the wall was the phrase, sweets to the sweet. Uh, Throughout the course of the story, she learns about the character on the wall. And she doubts all the stories that she's been told. Because of this, he appears before her, smelling like cotton candy with the sound of buzzing around him. And this is a quote from the story. That he was legend and she, in disbelieving him, had obliged him to show his hand. She looked now, down at those hands. One of them was missing. In its place, a hook. There will be some blame, he told her. They will say your doubts shed innocent blood. But I say, what's blood for if not for shedding? And in time, the scrutiny will pass. The police will leave. The cameras will be pointed at some fresh horror. And they will be left alone to tell the stories 
of the Candyman again. He's a creature of urban legend who, I mean, he only exists if people believe in him, which kind of goes along with the movie. But this, yeah. this Candyman does not resemble Tony Todd at all. He's described as having waxy yellow skin with blue lips and red rosy cheeks. Yeah, doesn't uh, doesn't sound like Tony Todd at all. No. However, his poetic language is still intact. At one point he says, I am rumor. It's a blessed condition, believe me, to live in people's dreams, to be whispered at street corners, but not have to be. You understand? And of course, throughout the story, he also says, be my victim. And uh, there's a whole seduction element to it, which all comes into play in 1992's Handyman. Based on this story, written and directed by Bernard Rose. It's the story of Helen Lyle, played by Virginia Madsen, who is uh, writing her thesis on the urban legend of Candyman. And so she goes to Cabrini Green in Chicago, which is a rundown. It's the projects. It's Mm -hmm. rundown. A few blocks away is like the rich part of town. So it's kind of weird that this little slice of hell is nestled in this sprawling heaven all around it. But here it is and bad things happen there. And of course she discovers graffiti. She come, becomes obsessed with the urban legend of Candyman. And then the story gets going. I have to admit, I have not seen this movie since it first came out in what? 1992? Yeah. 91? Yeah. And I don't remember a whole lot about it before this week. I, I remember thinking it was pretty good, but that was about it. I remember there was a, a ghost with a hook and he seduced the victim. That's all I remember about it. And I was very, very, very pleasantly surprised with that first movie. Uh, the atmosphere was just magnificent. The set decoration was really good, especially for the day that it was put out. And Tony Todd's the fucking man. But this is a movie that really took its time. I mean, I, I, I don't think you even saw Tony Todd until at least the 30 minute mark, did you? I think that's right. Yeah. It's definitely a more atmospheric, eerie sort of movie. Mm -hmm. You get to the second one, and that one relies completely on jump scares, which Mm -hmm. the first movie never needed. No. As a franchise, I had a massive problem. But as an individual movie, I would recommend that first movie to anybody. That was damn good it's one of my favorite horror movies it's up there with texas chainsaw massacre in my mind Mm -hmm. as one of my favorites uh there's a lot i really love about it Mm -hmm. i mean the tone and the atmosphere are just so good so the character the candy man i'm sure you all know how you summon him you look in the mirror and you say his name five times and that of course that goes back to like the legend of bloody mary which kids always played around with oh yeah it, uh, that was n- that was not in the short story whatsoever it's kind of interesting cuz it's also i mean in old school mythology and stuff the, there there was a lot about the power of a name like saying a name held power like in old norse mythology if you said thor's name he would appear instantly mm-hmm. so it's a It's an idea that's been around for centuries, really. Well, I mean, the other thing about this movie is it's one of those movies where, I mean, this story I don't think could have taken place in any other city than Chicago. Have you, you, I'm I'm assuming you've been out there? Yeah, I've been to Chicago before, yeah. Okay, so you know how literally... If you cross railroad tracks or go down a different block, the the feeling of the neighborhood completely changes. Mm-hmm. It can be 
you know, one street will be rich and glittery. The next street will be feeling kind of like uh, suburbia. The other street will be feeling kind of ghetto-ish. This movie really, really captured the feeling of that city in a way that most movies don't. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think that feeling is completely lost in the sequels that take place in New Orleans and I believe L.A. or something. Who can tell what that last one will get there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the atmosphere is completely gone. It's lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, this is just a really cool ghost story, but unlike most ghost stories, you're really sympathetic toward the ghost where, yeah, you can understand and completely sympathize with the reason why this dude's pissed. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I, I, it's still topical to this day, I think. Oh, absolutely it is. So the backstory of the Candyman, which is one of the other things I really love about this movie, is his backstory. Because usually, let's face it, these slasher motivations are almost non-existent. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're simplistic. If there is even, uh, even a glimpse at a motivation... Like in the original Halloween, what was Michael Myers' motivation? Killing babysitters. Yeah, but why? Eh, I don't know. Just because. Yeah, exactly. And this one you find out that uh, the Candyman used to be a, he was a freed slave who was also uh, a talented artist. Like an inventor, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a talented artist, which is awesome because that also plays into the whole idea of graffiti and street art in the movie. Mm -hmm. And he is hired by a rich white man to paint a portrait of the man's daughter and Candyman and the daughter kind of fall in love and have a relationship. And because of this, the town, the townsfolk learn about this and they're outraged and they lynch him and cut off his hand and pour honey all over him, causing him to get stung to death. It's pretty awful. Yeah, he uh, he has a right to be pissed. Yeah. The best part of that backstory in my mind is, one, it doesn't exist in the short story. Mm-hmm. Two, the director of this movie, Bernard Rose, asked Virginia Madsen and Tony Todd to come up with some sort of backstory behind the history of these two characters. Why is Candyman fascinated with the Helen character? Okay, that's actually really interesting. So Tony Todd came up with the character of, this is the one thing I hate about this, the character of Granville T. Candyman. Yes, his last name was Candyman. Uh. Yeah. I mean, that would change to the much better Daniel Robitaille and, the sequels and uh he came up with the entire backstory about the artist falling in love having a forbidden relationship with a white woman and being subsequently punished for that love and understandably so rose was so enamored with these ideas he just put them in the movie it was great yeah Now, one of the things that I really appreciate about this movie compared to a lot of other films of that era, the the villain or slasher, his face is not obscured. Right. It's pristine. It's downright handsome. Yeah. You don't get that with a Freddy Krueger or a Michael Myers or a Jason Voorhees those faces are kind of at best obscured, you know, but mostly completely blank and impersonal. This guy knows how to emote and convey feeling. And I kind of got the impression that his crimes weren't entirely malicious how so well i kind of got the impression that he was infatuated with virginia uh, virginia madison's character 
And he was trying to bargain with her saying, hey, come with me or I can do these awful things. But if you come with me, we'll have a good time. Hmm. That's interesting. I never thought about it like that. This movie works. On, well, you brought up the handsomeness part. Mm -hmm. And that was kind of the director's intention. In an interview with Fangoria, he said, the candy man is a romantic character, the dark, handsome lover who demands total surrender. You mm -hmm. love the candy man, then you'll die. But while all horror films are about sex, I wanted candy man to get away from the rape fantasies that one associates with slasher movies. Helen deals with her desires when she summons the candy man. She's like a priest who priest who's always asking for God. But what what would happen if God appeared and said, Here I am? That might be what the priest wants, but it would also drive him mad. All right. That is actually really interesting in the context of that first movie. In, you can watch the, the, the first movie in two ways. You can take the Candyman as existing and just ruining Helen's life. Just mm -hmm. because Helen refuses to believe in him and then he appears and demands her to believe in him. As he says over and over again, be my victim, surrender to me, etc. But also you can look at it as this woman is obsessed with this urban legend and it drives her insane. And yeah. she's the one doing all the murdering and whatnot. And you don't really get that ambiguity in the sequels. Oh, not at all. No, no there's no nuance whatsoever. No. Uh, I, I, I really cannot recommend that first one highly enough. It is such a damn good movie. And I, I have to admit, I was kind of, kind of skeptical about going into this with you because when I think of Clive Barker movies, I think of gory horror mixed with BD S and M. Yeah. That was very much a theme in his work for sure. Uh -huh. And I'm not knocking anybody who is into that, but to me, that's not chocolate and peanut butter to me. That's like steak and ice cream. Yeah. I don't think two most... great things that are, awesome on their own maybe i i just don't want to combine them i don't think most people realize that that first movie in the hell at least the first movie in the hellraiser franchise with pinhead people know who pinhead is they don't realize that movie is about kinky sex though oh it absolutely is i mean these are he the dude opens a fancy puzzle box and summons leather clad pleasure demons i was gonna say look at the way that everybody's dressed in that movie how can you not see that meanwhile pinheads come become iconic but people forget he's like a bdsm <laughs> chaos god so yeah yeah which again if that's your thing awesome i just don't know if i want to mix that with horror but yeah. This movie in particular really works with that. Yeah, and uh, I heard, I didn't hear, I read somewhere, I don't remember where I read, and I thought it was an apt comparison. They described the Candyman character as a black Dracula who's like smooth and sexy like Bela Lugosi. Completely. I can totally see that. I mean, there there was the movie Blackula. Mm-hmm. But that was almost cringeworthy compared to this, you know? No, I mean, this movie rests completely on the shoulders of Tony Todd, and he carries it all the way. Tony Todd's the fucking man in that first movie. Yeah, absolutely. His presence is undeniable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he is so fucking awesome in that first movie. The the graffiti in this movie, too. The The scene where Helen goes into the the room and finds the razor blades and candy on the the mattress and looks behind her and sees the huge massive portrait of candy man behind her oh with the uh gaping uh 
open mouth. Yeah, that's so yeah. striking. It's such a good image. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say about this movie, uh, except that it plays on childhood fears while also mixing a little bit of romance, romance and a little bit of erotica in just the right combination. Mm-hmm. And it's so damn good. So good. And I I really wish they had stopped there. Yeah. Um, one last thing. I, I Well, there's two things I want to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, that scene where all those bees are in Tony Todd's mouth. Uh, mm-hmm. Those bees were actually in Tony Todd's mouth. <sighs> they poured bees down into his throat. Oh, God. What a man. <laughs> oh, yes. What a man. Uh, apparently, they were, uh, I guess, uh, younger bees. They didn't quite have the stinging part of them yet, but still. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Uh, Virginia Madsen said about that. Um, first of all, she was allergic to bees, so she was. Oh, God. Out. Yeah, the whole time. But she said that she. During that scene, they poured the bees down his throat, and she could hear Tony Todd choking. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. Here's the thing: he sells it too. I mean, you you would never know. No, it, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing. No, Tony Todd's the fucking man. Yes. Uh, so my other favorite part of this movie is the ending. Because I just love the ending. So throughout the movie. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Where uh, Helen becomes a bit of an urban legend on herself. So Helen throughout the movie has been dating this uh, professor and he is having an affair. Yeah, he's a total shit heel. Helen's actually married to the professor and he's having an affair the whole time. And he's this unbelievable douche just ugh. Uh, yeah you're you're just waiting for him to get the hook yes and so as candy man frames helen for all these murders and whatnot and her reputation ke- keeps taking a beating it all leads to a huge bonfire that uh the community of cabrini green has uh and they have it in order to get rid of candy man in the movie this baby has been murdered the town and the community thanks but baby's still alive helen finds us out baby is in the middle of the the burn pile and she saves the baby as it's being set on fire yes and that that is actually a big thing that we kind of skipped over in order to save the baby she has to submit herself to the candy man she actually gives in yeah and mm-hmm. that's an, that's another difference from the short story, and I feel like this movie does it better. In the short story, Candyman actually kills the baby with razor blades, like just oh cut. damn. And Helen is trying to get the baby's corpse from the burn pile to show the kids what, or show the community what had happened. And she doesn't even make it out of the burn pile; she just submits completely and goes up in flames. And this one, she actually submits. But also breaks free and saves the baby uh, at the cost of her own life. And at the end, the community comes together, shows up at her funeral, and Mm -hmm. the douchebag. Yes, absolutely. As they should, Mm because she killed Candyman. And the little boy that has been her kind of her sidekick throughout the movie throws Candyman's hook in the, in the, uh, what is it, hole? Well, open grave yeah Yeah, that's the phrase i was looking for thanks (laughs) so the douchebag goes home and he's distraught and he's just crying in front of a mirror and oh helen helen you know he says it enough times and she appears in the mirror burnt to a fucking crisp too and i'm like that's awesome now she's Mm -hmm. the urban legend yes Great ending to a really good movie. Another source of inspiration from for this movie uh, may have came from a journalist named Steve Bogira, 
who wrote articles for the Chicago Reader in 1987-1990 about the murder of Ruthie Mae McCoy, a resident of Chicago's Abbott Homes housing project. 1987, she was killed by an intruder who entered her apartment through an opening behind the, the bathroom's medicine cabinet. Oh, Jesus. Which is a prominent plot point in mm-hmm. Candyman. So. Yep. So, Candyman, uh, Farewell to the Flesh. Had you seen this movie prior to this excursion, sir? Uh, yeah, I saw it a few weeks ago, yeah, for the okay. first time. All right. The only exposure I had to this was an advertisement where they showed the poster on the back cover of Preacher Number One. Okay. And even back in 1995, I'm thinking, okay, this just just doesn't look good. (laughs) And you know what? I was fucking right. Because it's just, it, it, it's essentially the same movie again. Yes, it is the same movie done in a much poorer fa- fashion. Yeah. I didn't completely hate it, though. I'll reserve that hate for the, the third one. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm with you on that one. But on the other hand, it's kind of pointless. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> it really is. I mean, I will appreciate the fact that they, at least in passing, mention the first movie and how the character of Helen was obsessed with this story. And most people think that she committed those crimes. Beyond that, it's just the same movie over and over again except i hate to say it but maybe tony todd looks too handsome in this movie Mm. question mark you're too handsome tony todd knock the fuck off well i mean in, in the first movie he was handsome but he still was dressed kind of kind of funky yeah where he had that huge collar made out of fur with an equally large coat that just was ill-fitting, but it fit with the times that he was supposed to live in. Mm -hmm. And in the subsequent movies, he was slick. He was cool. His hair was slicked back. He was just, uh, I mean, dressed to the T's. To me, that just doesn't fit the character. And on top of that, especially that second movie, the acting was just uniformly bad. Oh, the acting in this movie is that's one of the points I wanted to bring up. Yeah, I mean, and here's the thing. There are actors in this movie who have done really good work in other films. So I have to kind of lay the blame at the feet of the director who... Maybe the instructions he gave the people on the camera was just read the lines. You know, don't emote, don't have any kind of presence on on stage. Just read the lines and we'll make it look good. Yeah. Uh, So this movie begins, and this is probably my favorite part of the movie. It begins with... uh, one of Trevor, the douchebag from the original movies, colleagues going on tour. He wrote a book about the whole Candyman phenomenon based on what Helen went through. Of course, he knew Helen, he knew Trevor, and he's kind of profiting off that whole, uh, the whole thing. And he, um, even has a, a book the The book cover is uh, reflective, so you can actually look into it and say Candyman's name, which is very, very irresponsible. I was thinking that myself. Yes, I mean, geez, you know, you know, a lot of weird stuff happened in Cabrini Green, <laughs> but still, you're like, I'll write a book about it. But guess what? Reflective cover. I was so, just asking for a lawsuit. It is. So of course, during his uh, book tour, he's got to say the name five times. And he gets his. And I enjoyed that. 
And uh, after that, it was just a story of a cursed family mixed with the story of the original movie where Candyman is infatuated with a blonde woman uh, and he is basically blackmailing her with the life of a child. You know, if she submits to him, she, you know, will save the kid. It's essentially the same story again. Yeah, I guess the only twist is it's revealed that the main character, Annie, is a descendant of Daniel Robitaille and the woman he fell in love with, Caroline. Uh, Okay, but I kind of got the impression that Virginia Madsen's character in the first movie was maybe not necessarily a reincarnation of the lady that he fell in love with back in the day but at least connected to her because he flat out said and the graffiti on the wall said it was always you Helen yeah that was supposed to be the the implication that Helen was either the reincarnation or looked enough like her to stir the candy man up again Mm -hmm. um but to which I say, what's the point in this movie if we already have the first one, which was way better? Well, that's the other thing. Like, why the hell would he care about any descendants that he had if he was reunited with his one true love, which was. Yeah, that's kind of like, uh, you know, horn dogging your way into, uh, you know, your second wife's, you know, third cousin. Yeah. Um and Annie is pregnant, and Candyman seems to be very interested in that for some reason. Like, I mean, I'm not really sure why. It, it it seemed kind of creepy. I don't know why he was. I think he wanted the family to be all together and live together in death forever or something like that, but. Yeah, you know that that's kind of a common theme in the second and third movie, where yeah. you have to kind of guess and say, "Well, I think this is what they meant." You know, because I mean, it's just kind of vague, and I don't know. Uh, again, I, I'll, I'll say it again: Why watch the second one when it's the same story done poorly? compared to the first one yeah we do see Candyman's origins in this movie what did you think of that <sighs> that size needed. says it all it's not needed no i mean they conveyed everything you need to know just by telling not necessarily having to show you know i agree with that but because i mean one of the, i mean it, it's a stereotype for a reason but what an individual can imagine in their head is way worse than what can be conveyed on a, on the screen. A hundred percent. And really, and this is just like a, a, a glowing example of that. Yeah. And really, but, but Tomko, you, you find out why a mirror is important, why you say his name into a mirror and why that's important. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. And you want, yeah. you find out why he's called candy man. Yeah. Cute. Those they're both the worst parts of that. Like yeah. as I said before, the backstory is awesome. The parts that are added in this are not. So he's called Candyman because uh a kid in the crowd tastes the honey that was poured all over him and yells Candy Man because it's sweet, you see? Like candy. And so the what crowd a dick. Just, Yeah. So the crowd starts chanting Candyman at him as he gets stung to death. And then the uh, the woman's rich father who organized the lynch mob as Daniel Robitaille is dying holds Caroline's mirror to Candyman's face and says, look, look, look at ya. Well, could she love you now? Looking all hideous and shit. Yeah, I, I, I don't care. Yeah. Now, in an effort to not completely shit on this movie, I will say that they 
at least did a valiant effort at conveying a spooky atmosphere. Not just in the site decoration, but the random shots they had of the people that lived in that neighborhood. Mm Mm-hmm. Each shot of each face seemed to tell an individual story, and I'll give them all the credit in the world for that. That's about the best thing I can say about this movie. Well, I, it takes place during Mar- Mardi Gras. Yes, and, yes. And they beat us over the fucking head with the fact that this movie takes place in New Orleans during Mardi Gras. Wow. Well, and it. It goes right through Fat Tuesday and right to Lent. And you know what yes. you do in Lent? You sacrifice, give up your one earthly pleasure. Which, I mean, yes, the first movie was very much a story that took place in Chicago. And it feels like Chicago. But they don't tell you every five minutes. Hey, look at this. This is Chicago. Hey, look at this. This is the Miracle Mile. Hey, look at this. This is, you know, the skyline. Whereas this movie has an off camera character named the Kingfish, which if you've, uh, you know, any, you know, ever studied any kind of Southern history will know that it's a reference to, uh, Huey Long, uh, and it's it's like, okay, I get it. You're in New Orleans. Stop trying to establish that. Yeah. Uh, the the voiceover by the radio D- DJ, the Kingfish, that was, was obnoxious. So obnoxious and completely unnecessary. As I said before, the, the first movie was atmospheric and creepy and surreal. This one relied on jump scares and unnecessary narration Mm -hmm. and all sorts of tricks that, I don't know, just laziness, I think. Well, I don't know if it's laziness or if it's just one of those situations where the filmmakers kind of talk down to the audience. Yeah, I can see that. Uh, New Orleans, one of the stereotypes about that is the quote-unquote voodoo culture. And I think they they were trying to really convey that, but they just didn't have any subtlety about it. Yeah. I've I've been shitting all over this movie, but I didn't mind it too much. Uh, It's not the worst movie you've had me watch. You know, I, I did fair. not I did not like it. I didn't hate it, but I don't think I'll ever watch it again. Yeah, I don't know why there would be a need to, but maybe you'll no. you'll get a, a a hitch in your giddy up and really need to watch the franchise again. I don't know. Huh. Uh having well, said that, the second one was a fucking masterpiece compared to that third one i just finished watching that third one after attempting it three fucking times having fallen asleep twice during it i don't know what the hell happened yeah that brings it was just incomprehensible (laughs) this brings us to 1999's Candyman day of the dead and what we, a piece of shit this is. It's pretty bad. Uh, it takes place during Dia, Dia de los Muertos. Dia de los Muertes. The Day of the Dead. The Mexican celebration of the dead. Because we have to have a holiday theme, apparently. No. It's either... I mean, this came out four years after the the last movie. Mm-hmm. But in real time, like 25 to 30 years has passed because this stars uh, Caroline McKeever, who is the the daughter of the main character from the second movie. She's all grows up. 
And she's played by Donna Dierko, who was famous for being on Baywatch and getting naked in Playboy. All right, hold on. I got to Google this shit. Okay, I'll allow it. All right. I, I This movie was just incomprehensible. I could not follow the story. Granted, I had two beers while watching it, but damn. I'll try to break it down for you. All right. So the movie begins with Donna Dierko and her underwear because why not? (laughs) Donna Dierko is in your movie. Put her in underwear, huh? Oh, yeah. It's a nightmare. She's having nightmares about Candyman. Uh, turns out she's embraced her past. She knows all about Candyman and Daniel Robitaille being related to him. And uh, somehow she has all of his paintings, which she puts on display in an art gallery. And mm-hmm. the art gallery really leans into the urban legend of Daniel Robitaille. Which makes me think everyone believes Candyman is real, which makes me think that Candyman has no reason to have a beef with anybody because he'll never die because people believe in him. Which would also maybe lead credence to what the main character is saying to the cops. Clearly Candyman is real in this uh, continuity. Maybe they would listen to her. You would think, hey. This guy, he's killing all the people, you know, with the hook, you know, all you people. Well, not know only about that, it. but I mean, sh- you know, here is a very, I, I, I don't want to sound offensive, but a very dainty five foot three skinny lady. She can't do the damage that's being done to the victims. Physically. Yeah, he, right. Yeah. There, there would be no way. So, of course, there's a couple of corrupt cops in this. And Candyman appears because... Well, his name's in the movie. He has to appear. Well, that. And then some guy had to say his name five times for a publicity stunt at the art gallery opening. I mean, which we saw in the previous movie. That didn't end well. So now Candyman's back. I mean, he was supposed to be dead after the second movie. He was supposed to be dead after the first movie. Well, that was a little ambiguous, I thought. There was definitive proof that the way to kill Candyman was to find the mirror that he looked into as he died and break it. And then he would be broken forever. But he's not. He's here. And the movie is a big, huge mess. It really is. Mm -hmm. There's no other way to describe this. There's a bunch of random killings. Donnie Dierko is running around trying to find the paintings that were stolen by a gang. This is my favorite part of the movie, however. There's a, a street gang who believes in Candyman so much they have, like, creative occult worshiping him. And so that's why they stole the paintings. I like that touch. They don't do much with it, but mm-hmm. it's there. I don't know what else to say. I don't either because I watched this movie, what, uh, an hour and 10 minutes ago? And it's already fitting from my memory. It, it it was just all visual. And even the, even that wasn't that impressive compared to the first movie and even the second movie to a lesser extent. It just felt cheap. It felt like they were trying to milk that cash cow for every last bit of uh, money they could get out of it. And there wasn't that much left to begin with. It's a it's a bad movie. Yeah. Uh, The movie ends when. So in between the second and third movie, Candyman killed Annie, the, the main character from the second movie. But not before she gave advice to her daughter, which was, you have to make sure that people don't remember Candyman. You got to destroy the myth. So she 
basically frames one of the corrupt cops into taking the fall and saying that he is Candyman. And she tells the police that the cop who dies is Candyman. And she says in front of a mirror, there's no such thing as Candyman. And that allegedly, supposedly ends the curse forever. Well, at least until uh, 2021. Yeah. Which is a movie I'm hoping to see, well, tonight, actually, as of this. Huh. Uh, it's early Saturday morning. I plan on seeing it tonight. I'm very excited about it. I have high hopes. Um, I'll be honest with you. The only reason I'm interested in this new movie is Jordan Peele. Exactly. Same. My excitement's been tamp- tempered a little bit because I've heard some mixed reviews. I've heard that um, while Tony Todd is in it, there's a new candy man in it as well. Uh oh. Uh oh. Like there's multiple candy men. Oh no. Which could either be cool or could be awful. I often no, thought. No, give me Tony Todd. I agree. I often thought that, like, don't do a nightmare on Elm Street with Freddy Krueger without Robert England. Maybe, yeah, we learned that the hard way. Yeah, exactly. Maybe have one final movie with Robert England as Freddy and definitively kill off that character and create a new character for the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise so that it could continue. Because if you recast the character, it just ruins it. Yeah. I mean, you can do that with certain characters that are faceless, like, Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers. Right. But characters that are dependent on the actors to bring the presence and personality of that character. That's a, that's a tall fucking order. Yeah. Uh, There were a couple of failed attempts at sequels to Candyman before this one came along. Uh, In an interview with bloody disgusting, the original director and writer of uh, The Good Candyman, Bernard Rose, mm-hmm. was writing a sequel that was going to be called Candyman 2, The Midnight Meat Train. And he said that basically it the idea was taking Jack the Ripper and having Jack the Ripper style murders happening again. Uh, he said, whereas the first Candyman was about race, the idea was to make the second Candyman about gender. It was to be about the idea of this faceless, brutal killer who only attacked women in a horrific sexual manner and whose primary objective was to stop whores, in quotes, his weird, weird, moralistic take to it. The protagonist of the movie was going to be a British policewoman who starts to investigate the murders. Eventually, she finds out that... The stories about Jack the Ripper were nonsense. They were conspiracy theories. It was all a, they were all urban legends told to hide the fact that the rich ruling classes in the societies in England uh, were eating the poor. Literally? Yes. Yes. And, okay. And they needed a special class of person who they called a Ripper to supply them with meat. For their feasts. So there was not actually going to be Candyman in the movie. He said, yeah, that's right. No Candyman. He was mentioned in the story because I had Purcell, the professor from the first film, popping up as a character. He basically said the Rippers like a Candyman. So there we are. I had him in the script. I mentioned the word Candyman once. This is kind of like a Candyman. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pass. Exactly. No, what they should have done is they should have had one sequel and one sequel only where Helen was the antagonist. Absolutely. They could have had it about any number of things, about gender, about uh, equality in the workplace. They could have done any number of things, and that would have been pretty fucking cool. Yeah. Instead, Tony Todd was just too damn cool to leave by the wayside. I don't blame them for that, but 
I don't know. This reminds me of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre where the first movie was phenomenal, but it wasn't meant to be a franchise. No, not at all. Nobody was thinking franchise when they made it. Nobody was thinking no. franchise when Candyman was made. No. Uh, so, I mean, my final verdict, the first movie is damn good. Damn good. And I'm glad you recommended it to me. And I'm hoping that uh, Jordan Peele lives up to it. The second one and third one, eh, never going to watch again. Uh, the first one's a Stone Cold classic. Second one's decent. If I I can't say it's even decent when you know it's it's the same story again. I mean it is. But when the first you know, story was so good. Well, yeah, the first story was so damn good, but why repeat it? Give me something new. Give me something original. The first one was original. I can't say that I'd especially in nineteen ninety two ninety two, I I, I don't think I'd seen a story like that at the time. I mean, you want original. We touched mm-hmm. upon this briefly when we covered another horror franchise. In a 2019 interview, Tony Todd said that somebody approached him with the idea of Candyman versus Leprechaun. Oh. He said this was right around the time of Freddy versus Jason and Candyman versus Leprechaun came across my desk. I saw it and I said, I will never be involved in something like that. I respect the character. Once a horror character becomes something of an icon, reluctantly or not, you have to treat that with respect. I remember watching Abbott and Costello versus Frankenstein continuously as a kid and being amazed that my horror legends were making a comedy. So I guess there are some ways to make something like that work, but I wasn't interested in doing that with Candyman. We all know how I feel about the Leprechaun franchise. I'm not going to go into it again. Yes, that's in the archives. We yes. painfully watched every single Leprechaun movie, of which there are way too many. You wouldn't believe how many there are. It's insane. There are, what, six too many? If not more than that, too mm-hmm. many, yeah. there's also There was also rumors about Clive Barker creations colliding, Candyman versus Penhead, but... I don't know how you would make that work. I guess bring in the sex element, the seduction element. I don't know. It uh, would be forced and ridiculous. It would just be uncomfortable for Tom to watch. <laughs> you would just cringe and be creeped out the whole time. Yes. I mean, I have no problem feeling, you know, watching gore and murder. I don't want to watch the icky stuff. So, any fu- anything else that you want to say about these three movies, sir? If you're a horror fan, you owe it to yourself if you haven't already to see Candyman 1992. Yes, yes, great fucking movie. Yeah, I wish more slashers and horror movies took the time to have as much thoughtfulness. And subtlety. Yeah, everybody that wants to make movies or is interested in horror needs to see this movie. Mm-hmm. Because yes. this is the way you should do a, a horror movie. Two and th- Candyman 2 and 3? Yeah, they're there. Buy them on Blu-ray if you need a, an extra coaster on your end table. Some people really like having the complete collection of something. So in that case, there you go. Huh? But the third one is just not good. So, I th- uh, Yeah, that's one of those... It's it's uh, I I don't want to say it's unwatchable, but it's approaching that. I mean, I know the the premise of the show. Someone's favorite movie is every movie is someone's favorite, but I have a hard time believing that Candyman Three: Day of the Dead is someone's favorite movie. If it's your favorite movie, I will be su- silently judging. Yes. <laughs> if it's your favorite movie, you haven't seen Candyman nineteen ninety two yet. So <laughs> take it upon yourself to do that immediately. Tomko, yes. where can people find you on this World Wide Web? Uh, you know what? I am in a bit of a lull, but uh, my partner Jake and I are uh, plotting and scheming to bring back a little show called Jake and Tom Conk the World. Uh, the archive is available out there on the World Wide Web, anywhere you want to find a podcast. If you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Twitter at The Drunken Dork or on Facebook 
at a little page called Jake and Tom Conquer the Group. What about you, Randall? Yeah, uh, you can find me on Twitter at m retail slave, named for my big dumb comedy show, Miserable Retail Slave. I do way too many podcasts. Miserable Retail. <laughs> what do you got? About twenty now. I got four. That seems Damn. Like ridiculousness. Uh, Miserable Retail Slave is li- like the flagship, so go listen to that. It's fun and silly. There's a new episode dropping probably about the same time you hear this. So that you should do that. If you have movies that you want us to cover, we have like several movies that people want us to cover. So, Yes, and I am looking forward to them all. I, I genuinely am. Yes. So if you have a B-movie cult classic underappreciated gem that you think more people need to know about send them our way someone's favorite movie podcast at gmail.com send me an email with the movie and maybe why you want us to cover them that would be great we love doing those we got more coming up uh next week however we're doing hard ticket to hawaii (laughs) the legendary andy sedaris he has a whole franchise actually called the lethal ladies and i i'm gonna look this up because people will sc- scream at me real loud if i get that wrong i am uh eagerly anticipating this one sir i mean it's kind of like a legendary cult movie okay i have to admit i've not heard of this one but i am willing to embrace it with open arms uh, the the Lethal Lady series that Andy Sedaris created, um, it's outrageous action, ridiculousness, and uh, Playboy playmates and centerfolds are like the main characters. Hey, and this is what you get. You can actually get all of his movies together in a DVD set, and there's like ten of them or something, seven of them. I don't know. God damn, there's a lot of them. For seven fifty on Amazon, so I mean, nice, right? That's the hallmark quality, right there. It is. It really is. So next time we're doing hard ticket to Hawaii. I sp- I keep saying that weird. Hard <sighs> ticket to Hawaii. Man, I don't know if I appreciate the way I say Hawaii. Uh, after that, we're doing and Tomco hates this form, hates me for it. We're doing cool as ice. <sighs> Son of a bitch. And then after that, because Tomco requested it, and I was actually just thinking about this movie yesterday on my drive to work, we're doing Flight of the Navigator. Yes! I don't know if you yes. know this about me or not, Tomco, but when I was a young, young little boy... You were abducted by aliens? That was my favorite movie, yeah. All right, I am looking forward to that. All right, so start watching those movies. Send your movies in, your movie requests in. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. See ya.